It's been a little while since I've produced uh, one of these Ukraine Explainer videos, uh, and that's because the, the war kind of has stabilized in the last few weeks, and I'm a little bit dedicated to the idea of uh, uh, not saying something if you don't have something to say. Uh, but, but in the last few days, and, and to be clear, uh, today is the 19th of April. Um, in the last few days, the war has taken some dramatic uh, uh, changes. Uh, most importantly, Russia has now uh, begun, by, by all appearances, has begun a major new assault in a region uh, that we typically call the Donbass. Um, after after a, a, a much broader, wider-ranging campaign in the early days of the war, uh, particularly focused on trying to seize Kiev, uh, Russia uh, failed in that and performed quite poorly. It has now pulled back from Kiev uh, moved troops uh, into eastern Ukraine and parts of Russia adjacent to eastern Ukraine um, and has basically announced a new smaller goal, which is to seize uh, parts of Ukraine uh, that, that are the parts of two oblasts, which is a Ukrainian term meaning state or region, uh, that were partially seized by Russia uh, in the war that started in 2014. So I'll, I'll try to explain what's going on here. Um, and what the prospects are. So first, Donbass. What does this term mean? Donbass is just a, a, a smashing together of, of, of the words Donetsk and basin in, in Russian or in Ukrainian, and it refers to this massive basin of coal uh, that underlies uh, a region around uh, what's called uh, the Donetsk River. There's also, of course, a city, a massive city of a couple million people called Donetsk, and a region of Ukraine called Donetsk. When we talk about Donbass, we're typically uh, talking about a region of eastern Ukraine. So in the context of this discussion, eastern Ukraine and Donbass are more or less synonymous, though there are other parts of eastern Ukraine, such as Kharkiv, and that region that are not included in the term Donbass. But specifically, when we say Donbass, we mean two regions of Ukraine, or two oblasts of Ukraine. Uh, one is called Donetsk, and one is called Luhansk. In 2014... Russia-sponsored forces uh, tried to uh, sponsor local uprisings, uh, not only in Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, but throughout eastern and southern Ukraine. And the idea was that they would spontaneously take over these various cities and towns and sort of declare that they wanted to join Russia. Well, in almost all of these places, these sp externally sponsored uprisings failed, they, um, they had a little more success in uh, Luhansk and Donetsk, um, but by April, May, I, sh I should say really by the summer of 2014, uh, Ukrainian forces, as weak and disorganized as they were, were in danger of, of essentially um, taking over, retaking that territory that had been seized by those Russia-sponsored separatists. At that time, in, in the summer of 2014, the Russian army invaded uh, and, and basically routed the Ukrainians uh, and took a chunk of Donetsk Oblast and a chunk of Luhansk Oblast, which declared themselves to be the Donetsk People's Republic, the Luhansk People's Republic. And for eight years, from 2014 to 2022, sort of that was the status quo. I've simplified things a bit. Um, on February 21st, just a few days before Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, Vladimir Putin announced for the first time that Russia was recognizing the independence of those two uh, so-called republics from Ukraine. He was recognizing their sovereignty, but he left it a little bit vague as to whether he meant the territory that they controlled or recognized all of the territory they claimed, only about you know roughly half of which they controlled. That is to say, not the entire uh, regions of Donetsk and Luhansk. He subsequently made it clear um, that he meant the entire territory, which was his way of saying that Russia was going to support those uh, territories expanding to seize more territory from Ukraine. And as that happened, or basically just after he said that, is when Russia invaded much more broadly across Ukraine. Um, in other words, these territories have been uh, fought over for eight years, not just since February 24th, um, and provided at least part of the justification in the run-up to this war. So why is Putin and Russia, uh, why are they doing this now after having made this big attempt to seize Kiev and overthrow the Ukrainian government? I think there are two related reasons. One is political and one is strategic. 
The political reason is that if Russia can seize a bunch of territory in uh, Luhansk and Donetsk Oblast, in particular if he can seize all of the territory that was uh, sort of in the official borders of those oblasts, um, it can claim to have achieved an important victory for those re so-called republics. So in, in other words, it allows it will allow Putin and Russia to declare victory and go home if that's what they choose to do. Um, it's also the case um, that by seizing the Black Sea coast in southern uh, Donetsk Oblast, particularly around a city called Mariupol, where the fiercest fighting has been going on and where it looks like Ukrainian resistance, which has been something like the, the resistance in the Battle of Stalingrad in the 1940s, um, it appears that the Ukrainian resistance is on the, the verge finally of collapsing there. Um, if that happens, that will then Russia will then control a corridor along the north coast of the Black Sea that will connect Russia with Crimea and therefore really solidify Russia's uh, economic and political control over Crimea. It will make its seizure of Crimea much easier to manage. So that would be an important strategic and practical victory. So I think that's why this is, is happening now and why there's so much focus on it. Well, what are the prospects for this next phase of the battle? And I should say... Um, this is really going to be crucial to the outcome of the overall war. Um, so so it's, it's, it's as important as anything that's happened so far. Um, but what are the prospects? The predictions, you look at all the Western military analysts who are looking at this stuff, and they tend to say that while Russia might achieve some gains here and there, it's going to have a difficult time achieving its overall goals. Why? Uh, part of it has to do with simply the number of troops uh, Russia has at its disposal, Russia has, it appears, about 75 of these so-called battalion tactical groups to, to dedicate to this war. Roughly speaking, 1,000 soldiers to a battalion tactical group. So that's 75,000 soldiers, um, you know, with armor and artillery and all of that. That seems like a lot, but it's actually a fairly large uh, front on which they're going to be fighting. And in that respect, it's not a huge number of troops. Um, the standard rule in, in, uh, in warfare is that if you're attacking a defended position, you need to have a three-to-one superiority. And at least at the strategic level, that is to say, uh, the, the whole front, Russia does not have that. Uh, there's also the evidence that we've seen already in this war about the effectiveness of Russian fighting forces that many people uh, have then become skeptical about their ability to pull this off. Clearly, uh, there's been problems with Russian morale in this war, while at the same time, Ukraine's morale has been quite high. Uh, finally, there are, there are questions about... Um, I shouldn't say finally, but anyhow, there are questions about uh, Russia's ability to keep its supply lines, to, to keep this offensive supplied as it goes on. Uh, compared to trying to invade Kiev from the north, Russia's supply lines will be shorter than they were in that attack, uh, but there are still real questions as to whether Russia has the logistic capability to keep this going. Um, at the same time, there are some concerns about the Ukrainians being able to keep their troops supplied with things like um, ammunition um, and fuel. A much bigger question that some people are asking is, um, is this kind of war going to be more suited to Russia? The sense that instead of trying to run tanks into cities where, where tanks are, are notoriously difficult uh, uh, you know, to, to use successfully, uh, is this more suited to Russian uh, style of warfare in terms of its more traditional World War II tanks on wide open flat spaces, the sort of farmland of the Ukrainian East? Um, I think a lot of people believe that that's true. At the same time, uh, there are questions as to whether tank warfare, maybe uh, um, you know, 80 years after World War II, whether tank warfare maybe is just simply not as viable as it once was, largely to the development of all kinds of, uh, of uh, shoulder-fired um, anti-tank weapons. We're going to see. Um, people who, who are interested in the future of warfare are watching this war, this war very closely. So, to summarize... Most predictions are that Russia is going to achieve, uh, struggle to achieve its goals in this attack. But I want to strike an important caveat, which is the people who are telling us this, and they are experts and they all know more than I do, they're also the same people that told us that Russian troops were going to conquer uh, Kiev, with it, uh, conquer the Ukrainian army and surround uh, and take Kiev in a matter of days. So uh, to say something I say over and over again, war is inherently uh, difficult to, uh, to predict. And so while I tend to believe uh, that Russia's going to struggle, I won't be surprised if we're surprised. 
Um, what's the range of possible outcomes? That's probably a, a, a better thing to think about, right? What are some of the different scenarios that, that might be solved rather than trying to predict something that's inherently uh, unpredictable? On the one hand, we could imagine uh, uh, some columns of Russian tanks breaking through Ukrainian lines um, and really making, uh, uh, endangering large numbers of Russian troops with surrounding them, kind of the classic uh, uh, penetrate and surround maneuver of World War II. And that could lead to a fairly substantial um, defeat for Ukrainian forces, and I don't think we should rule out that possibility. The flip side of that is I think there's some possibility um, that the Russians will simply batter themselves against uh, the Ukrainian forces. It's important to take into account, in contrast to the battle around Kiev, this battle is going to be fought uh, against positions that have been dug in for the last eight years, right? This is along a front that's existed for eight years and has been militarized and has been fought over for eight years. So in most places, the Ukrainians um, are very well dug in. And, uh, and so you, there's a scenario in which the, the, um, the Russians attack this, they lose forces, they batter themselves, they lose morale, and, and you could imagine a Ukrainian counterattack um, routing the Ukraine, routing the Russian forces, and actually pushing them back and beginning to seize a lot of the territory that, that Ukraine lost in 2014. I'm not counting on that happening, but it's not out of the question. Actually, I think the most likely outcome is that in some places Russia seizes some ground. They've actually seized a little bit already. In many places, they don't seize too much. Um, or even if they have some success, eventually they run out of steam as their uh, lines of communication get longer. Um, and that at some point down the road, four months from now or so, um, when sort of both armies have, have run out of steam a little bit, we've got a new line of control. Um, and, and, and that line of control begins to um, solidify into stalemate. And that stalemate may endure until one side musters up enough force to try to change it again, or, or perhaps things settle down. Uh, just the way that this front was more or less static for about seven years from, from uh, 2015 until 2022. So hard to see um, on what's going to happen. What is the, the, um, the, the crucial thing to say is that um, as well as things have gone for Ukraine in the first phase of this war, this is now a new phase. And this is going to be every bit as decisive in terms of does this war turn into a, um, a, a, a some kind of salvageable, salvageable victory for the Russians? Um, does, it, uh, does it turn into a complete disaster for Russia, which in some respects it's already been. Um, are the Russians able to recoup that initial disaster or not? Um, and depending on what happens on the battlefield, we'll then, uh, we, we will then see what the terms will be in terms of the battlefield for whatever uh, peace negotiations might follow. And again, the peace negotiations will always be linked to um, who's doing how well on the battlefield. And that is another reason why this is uh, an incredibly important uh, battle to watch. The sad thing to say is, uh, uh, without a doubt, um, the level of violence is going to go up, um, in part because Russia is more determined. I think the Russians are more angry. They are more vengeful. Uh, and they seem to be um, even more willing to strike and kill civilians than they were in the early phases of this war. So uh, there's a great deal at stake. Um, but any way you slice it, it's, it's going to be a massive tragedy uh, for the Ukrainians and perhaps for many Russians as well.